Ah, so many people. Hello, Milik. Hello, Ingo. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, today, we're very fortunate to have Andre Bauer, professor of mathematics at the University of Ljubljana, uh, who will tell us about the Countable Reels, which is joint work with James Hansen. Um, so I'm very excited about this because I've been wondering whether this is all not some elaborate practical joke, and I'm looking forward to finding out the truth of this. So uh, Andre, please take it away. Um, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, today I'd like uh, to talk about some work in progress, which however, I think has matured to the point where I am brave enough to present it to you because it's still, it's been, it's, it's held water now for a month. Um, and uh, let me just emphasize again that this is a joint work with James Hansen, who sent me an email a while ago and he said, hey, there's this thing in computability uh, degrees, which I think ought to help. And then we thought about it. And today I'm going to present you, present what, what we came up with. Okay, so the talk has three parts. Uh, in the first one, I'm just going to review a little bit uh, countable and uncountable sets, uh, especially since we're going to do things intuitionistically. And uh, then one has to be careful about definitions and also how uh, countability and uncountability relates to the real numbers. Then we're going to discuss the main idea of the construction, which is uh, a construction of certain <laughs> sequences that were uh, found by Joseph Miller, who we may or may not have here, whom I've never met. Um, uh, but James knows knew about those. And that's sort of the gist of what needs to be done. And then once we have the main idea, there remains the technique of coming up, building up the right kind of a topos around the idea. And that's the third part. The third part has a lot of technicalities that I'm going to skip because a lot of them are well-known constructions in realizability theory. And uh, I will focus on the idea to try to explain how it all works. Okay, so let's go. Let's first uh, um, review some basic facts about uh, uncountability and so on. So uh, we, again, I emphasize that since we're doing here constructive mathematics, we need to be careful about definitions and we should not be throwing in random uh, case distinctions uh, unless we absolutely have to. So let's say that a set A is countable if there is a surjection from the national numbers onto one plus A. One plus A just means the disjoint sum of a singleton and A. And the purpose of having the singleton is so that you can also enumerate the empty set by always enumerating the element of the singleton. And so then you never actually enumerate anything in A. And a set is uncountable if it is not countable. So it's the negation of countable. For an inhabited set, and we are only going to consider inhabited sets today when we speak about countability, the one plus A trick is not needed because if you know that a set A has an element, then whenever you don't want, you can always enumerate that element. Um, so uh, at the very least. So uh, this becomes just that the set A is countable if and only if there is a subjection from N onto A. Oh, I forgot to ask, are people going to ask me questions during, because that's probably during my talk, or um, is there, are, are there instructions on what people should do if they have a question? We can do it however you prefer. I would, um, I would prefer to be interrupted then. Okay, uh, okay, so um, people can post things in the chat and, and they can also, I guess, interrupt. Okay. If that's I have the chat here, but I might not see it, in which case somebody should speak up, please. Okay. Tell me that there's a question. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so we can go on. Now, how does one prove that a set is uncountable? Well, there, there is a very, very famous way of doing this, namely diagonalization. So let me review this, uh, but let me review it in the way that uh, I think is the best way of doing it. So first we have Lavier's fixed point theorem, which is the theorem stated here, which says the following, if you have a subjective map from 
Okay, so this is actually a special case of Lebesgue's point point theorem that we are going to use today. But it says the following: If you have a surjection from n onto a to the n, then every map from a to a has a fixed point, and the proof is a one-liner. Uh, well, I should have used a smaller font. Anyhow, it's a one-liner. It's a very short proof, very straightforward, and it has diagonalization in there, right there. There is diagonalization. It's this one here, and uh, it produces fixed points. Now, classically, you can't you can't really come up with any interesting examples of this because in classical set theory, the only set A that satisfies the condition is the singleton set. And so then, yes, well, we get the fact that every endomap on the singleton map set has a fixed point. Nevertheless, in intuitionistic mathematics, there can be interesting cases of this. But this is a bit beside the point because I will only be using the, uh, the, the following corollary, namely that if you find that if you, if you have a map F from A to A that doesn't have a fixed point, well, then obviously A to the N cannot be countable. So that's the contrapositive form of the theorem which follows from the theorem. And this is the form which people usually see when they prove uncountability. So how does uncountability, how does uncountability follow from this? Here are some case, some examples, but let me first define omega to be the set of truth values, or if we're in a topos, it's the sub-object classifier, or if you're in a set theory, this is the power set of the singleton. Um, I am not doing any type theory today. So if somebody wants to ask about type theory, that they should save for the end. Thank you. So we're just going to do good old math. Now, um, uh, let two be the set of the booleans. So that's just the discrete set, which has two, two elements, zero and one, and they're separated from each other. Now, the following sets are uncountable, and these are well-known facts. Uh, and what I am emphasizing here is that these are entirely constructive proofs. There is nothing weird going on here. So uh, the set of all sequences, or the bare space, is uncountable because the successor map has no fixed points. So that's that one. Then the counter space is also um, uncountable because negation as a map that switches zero and one has no fixed points. And then also the power set of M or the space. So this is actually now going to be, we can identify the proposition, the propositional functions of the natural numbers with the power set of N. This one also is uncountable. So because negation has no fixed points. Um, so as I already mentioned, Omega to the A can be identified or is isomorphic to the power set of A. Uh, two to the A would then be the set of decidable subsets of A, but we're not really going to care so much about this today. Uh, one thing that needs to be emphasized, though, is that constructively, first of all, two and omega need not be um, isomorphic. And in fact, to say that they are isomorphic is to claim excluded middle. And then more importantly, for anybody who is used to terminology in computability theory, you should note that constructively, the real numbers and the counter space are very different objects. They are not at all the same. So you should really think about what happens in topology. In topology, the counter space is a compact zero dimensional space. And the real numbers are connected and they're not compact, they're locally compact. So they're not the same space. And also constructively, they're very different. So I would never, ever call an element of two to the n a real. Uh, and and be, for this talk, we really shouldn't do that because we will create confusion. Uh, similarly, the real numbers are not isomorphic to the power set of natural numbers. Classically, they are. But constructively, that's not something that we can demonstrate. And so we really should think of, think of it's better to think of our oh, story as, as a topological space if you really need to think about it in any way. OK, so because R is not uh, isomorphic to any of these, which, have we, which were shown to be uncountable, then we should ask, how do we prove that R is uncountable? Well, this, you can still have a diagonalization method. You just have to organize yourself a little bit differently. So let me review 
what is, I think, an optimized proof of counters from, uh, what was it, 18, 1871 or 74, the first proof that he had. His second proof was the diagonalization method on this line, but his first proof was more like what follows here. It's not exactly the same, but it's the same idea. Uh, the idea is the following. You can prove that uh, um, R is uncountable by diagonalizing, by showing that you can diagonalize against every sequence. What do I mean by that? I mean to say that given any sequence A of real numbers, there is an X which avoids all terms of the sequence. And one way to construct this, if I can draw a little picture, is that you start in the interval 0, 1, and then you narrow down this interval so that on step on the first step, I'm going to avoid the first term of the sequence. So I ask, where is the first term of the sequence, a0? And suppose that a0 is somewhere here. Then I narrow down my interval here, over here, to this part. And I'm using fifths, which would why it will be clear in a moment why I'm using fifths on the next slide, but that's what I do. I go here down to one fifth. Then I ask, where is A1? And so then A1 is somewhere. And I always look to see, I, I, look, I look at the midpoint. And then if A1 is over here, if it's on this side, I go on to the other side. Okay, so I go in whichever direction avoids the next term. And I'm going to get a sequence of nested intervals. And then the limit point will be an element of all these intervals. But the nth interval avoids the nth term, so x will avoid all the terms. So that's the usual proof. I used excluded middle because I made a decision by comparing the midpoint to the term, and then I made a decision. So I'm assuming that every real number is either greater than one half or less than one half. Here, it's greater or less than or equal. Here is the excluded middle. Now, this excluded middle can be avoided if you, you can trade it for countable choice. So let's see how we exclude, how we can avoid it, but we'll still use a countable choice. Actually, the, what I'm going to do now is dependent choice, but it's an exercise to optimize the proof so that it uses countable choice. Now, what, what is dependent choice? It's a form of countable choice where you make a sequence of choices, but every choice that you make may depend on the choices you made so far. So now the picture is slightly different. What we do is we take our interval. So I'm just going to do the first step, but then every, every subsequent step is, 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 is um, the same thing. You split it up into fifths and you go like this. Instead of deciding whether the term A0 is in the left or the right half, you ask a slightly more a uh, reasonable question. You say, is A somewhere here? Is it here? Or is it here? You see, I give myself some space. There's some overlap. And this is the overlap I need so that I can avoid the excluded middle. And so now I say, OK, if A is somewhere over here, then I will go in the opposite direction. So I will take, I, I will go over to the first fifth. But if A is somewhere over here, then I'll go to the last fifth. You can do this because the real numbers constructively satisfy the fact that if you have such overlapping intervals, when they, when they overlap a lot like this, see these two, these two. so this is the, uh, the A, the overlap, the A and the B overlap. When they overlap, then they actually cover the whole interval. But if they just touch, then they need not cover. So this is how you get rid of the excluded middle. But now we have a different problem. When my term, if A0 is somewhere here, so that it's in both parts, then I need to make a choice as to whether I go left and right. Both choices work, but I have to make a choice. And that's what causes this reliance on the dependent, on dependent choice. So now we have a proof of diagonalization for R, which then of course implies that R is uncountable, but now we're using choice, a little bit of choice. So a question that has been open for a while is whether we can prove that R is uncountable 
without any choice and without any excluded middle. One would first say, ask, of course, well, maybe we can just do this, the exact same thing, but we could maybe avoid choice as well. That we know is not the case. Diagonalization breaks down intuitionistically. When I say intuitionistically, I'm avoiding the word constructively because very often constructively means also using dependent choice. So I will use today the word intuitionistically to mean just pure intuitionistic logic, or if we're in a topos, the internal language of a topos, or if we are in some intuitionistic set theory, then that intuitionistic set theory is certainly without any choice principles. And uh, there is a remark by Bas Peters, and he gives credit to Pino Rossolini uh, in a paper of his. These are, by the way, you got the notes in the chat, and these are clickable, but please click later, otherwise you will start reading the internet. Um, the, in, the, the point is that in the topos of sheaves over the real numbers, you can validate the following statement. Uh, no, you cannot validate. Okay, so the topos does not validate the eternal statement, which is just the statement of diagonalization. Every sequence for every sequence there exists a point X such that that point avoids the sequence. Uh, by the way, the avoiding the, the sequence here is done in this way where you want the distance from every term to be positive. Uh, this is not validated in that topos, and I don't have the time to discuss this, but the note explains it nicely and it even has a picture. It's not too complicated to see what happens there. So we can't hope to just recover diagonalization just out of nothing. We cannot replay the same, the same thing. However, the same topos. So why is it? If I could prove diagonalization just using intuitionistic logic, then the topos would have to validate it, but it doesn't. Um, by the way, this topos also validates that the reals are not countable. That is to say, there does not exist a subjection from M to R. That's because, in principle, diagonalization could break down, but there might still be some other proof that the reals are um, uncountable. So we don't know. What we do know now is that we if we if we try to prove non uncountability of R, it's not going to go through diagonalization. It would have to be something else. But today, I hope to convince you that actually uh, it can happen that the real numbers are countable. Uh, let me uh, simplify things a little bit. This will, this is going to make things easier. Uh, I'm going to reduce uncountability of the real numbers to uncountability of the closed interval. So it's a, it's it's a nice uh, it's a it's not too hard to see that. Um, well, first of all, if the real numbers are countable, then obviously so is the um, so is the closed interval because you can retract R onto zero one. But also vice versa, it works because you can cover R with countably many copies of the closed interval such that they have a lot of overlap. And when they have a lot of overlap, then you will be able to um, produce the enumeration. And I give here an explicit one. And this, I don't think we have to do this here. You can read it on your own. Now, before we attack countability, let's also think about subcountability. So say that a set S is subcountable if you can embed it via some injection into the natural numbers and say that it is a subquotient of the natural numbers if it is a quotient of a subset of n. These are both measures of smallness, so to speak, because one would imagine that, uh, you know, if something embeds into n, into the natural numbers, it can't be that big. And if it's a, even a quotient of a subset, then also maybe it's not that big. However, intuitionistically, size is a tricky thing. And just because something is subcountable doesn't mean that it's going to be small according to some other measure of smallness. In particular, in the effective topos, at least this is well known, uh, the real numbers object is a subquotient of the natural numbers because lots and lots of objects are like that. Um, uh, in particular, the real numbers are like that. And a while ago, I constructed a, uh, an injection from the bare space into the natural numbers in the, to in the realizability topos over infinite time Turing machines. So uh, Joel Hamkins 
uh, infinite time Turing machines can be used to construct a realizability topos, which has amazing properties. And one of them is that there is an injection from R into the natural numbers. However, in both of these toposes, the real numbers are uncountable. It is entirely possible constructively or intuitionistically to have an uncountable subset of the natural numbers. In fact, claiming that every subset of the natural numbers is countable implies excluded middle. Why is it the case that the reals are uncountable? Because every realizability topos validates dependent choice, therefore diagonalization kicks in. So this is a remark just so that we are careful and we distinguish various notions of smallness. Uncountability is not really related to subcountability. Another point that we need to discuss is the fact that there are several constructions of real numbers. Um, there are three that are most common and they differ in how complete the numbers are. So the Cauchy reals give you a construction of the reals, which is Cauchy complete in the sense of metric spaces. That is to say that any Cauchy sequence has a limit. Then there is the construction of the Dedekind reals which says that if you define a now constructively it has to be a double-sided dedicated cut you should not be using single-sided cuts constructively they have to be double-sided and they have to be formulated in a night you know carefully but it's a very nice formulation uh, you can look at paul taylor's papers on abstract stone duality where the dedicated construction is really optimized anyhow that the, they give a notion of completeness that makes the reals more complete in general than just uh, metrically complete, namely that any dedicated cut straddles a real. Uh, and then there is the third construction, the McNeil reals, where we complete so that every bounded inhabited subset has an infimum and a supremum. Uh, at least in Ljubljana, this is the notion of completeness that is taught to first years when they learn about, in the, about real analysis. But classically, these are all these are all going to be the same notion. Um, constructively, however, they may differ. Now, it could in principle happen that some of these are, you know, that for instance, one of them is countable and then the other ones are not countable. And we've just seen that just because one of them is countable doesn't mean that the smaller ones will be countable. So we have to be careful. Now, what is known? The following is known the McNeil reals are uncountable intuitionistically. And I invite you to look later at a very nice proof that was written up by Ingo Blechschmidt and Matthias Hutzler. Um, and they use Knastertarski's fixed point theorem. And I think they, uh, they say, I think it's Levy's proof. They adapt the proof of Levy, but I don't know which of the many Levy's it is. Um, and I see, you will see, uh, yes, uh, Ingo is making uh, a comment in the chat that I think I will uh, also make later on. Um, so it looks like maybe we solved the problem. Well, in a way we did solve the problem because one kind of reals is uncountable. However, this is not a very good kind of reals. You would imagine that the real, in the reals, if you take, if you take the interval from zero to infinity, and then you take the interval from one to minus infinity, you'd think that they cover the reals. But if this happens in the McNeil reals, then excluded middle holds. So this is not a very nice notion of reals unless you're okay with excluded middle, but then it's, you know, then you live in a different world. And I explained this in a blog post where I summarized an argument gave, given by Toby Bartels on the constructive news mailing list. So how about accountability of RC of the Cauchy and the Dedekind reals? Today I'm going to today I'm going to uh, answer the question for the Dedekind reals. So I don't know the answer for the Cauchy reals. Okay, let us now proceed to uh, this uh, basic idea of what needs to be done, and we're going to think about. Uh, and what is in a way a naive idea that doesn't work, but then it does, but then it works. Okay, 
So one could try to do it like this. We would have some sort of a topos, which is uh, like a realizability topos, say uh, some, some sort of constructive world. But in this constructive world, things get computed with respect to an oracle, some sort of a magical sequence. So you could just try to force an enumeration of the real numbers by adjoining to your computation a magical sequence that will um, that enumerates some reals, but somehow also the machines can't diagonalize against it. So when they try, they fail. Now this here here is a, a bad attempt. So for instance, you could say. Okay, we're going to do Turing machines, but we're going to throw in an oracle that enumerates all computable reals. Well, that's not going to work because we can still diagonalize against Turing machines, which such an oracle will just produce some other real that is not computable. Uh, it may not be computable, but it will certainly be computable with respect to the oracle that we threw in. And then you think and you say, ah, but maybe we didn't try enough. How about if we have a really fancy sequence of reals? No, you can diagonalize against any single oracle that you come up with. Okay, so if you have any kind, any single oracle you come up with, you will be able to diagonalize just by the usual argument. And then you say, okay, so but how about if we stop using Turing machines and we have some special partial combinatory algebra? That we design so that things happen. No, every realizability topos validates dependent choice. So you can forget about all realizability toposes. It's not going to work. But these ideas are not entirely wrong. So to explain what happens, uh, oh, I lost the I lost the remark that uh, okay, I can do that later. Ingo made a nice constructive news post a while ago where he reviewed all the ways in which all the ideas that don't work. So uh, there is more about the toposes and so on in Inga's note, if anybody's interested about the things that don't work. Okay, so to explain the idea, we need to be a little bit more careful about what does it mean to have a, an oracle for a sequence of reals? Let's be a bit careful about that. So first of all, let's have oracles for real numbers. Uh, there is a computable proper quotient map from the counter space to zero one. And that just says, I can represent, there is a nice, there's a nice enough way of representing real numbers here by sequences. You, you should not be using the digit binary digit expansion. You need to do something fancier. It's not important what it is. The important thing is that you get a nice enough map where sequences of bits, infinite sequences of bits, represent real numbers in zero one. So say so that such a, such a, well, this one is beta. Say that such a beta represents X when Q maps it to X. And let all of X be the set of all sequences that represent X. So one way to think about this beta is that beta is an oracle for X. And here's an important point, every real number has many oracles that represent it. This set O of X, if you require Q to have these properties, computable proper quotient map, O of X, it, this can never be just all singletons. You will always have some real numbers that have many oracles. Another point, which is a technical comment, but it is essential for, um, for uh, Miller's construction is that we are arranging things in such a way that the set of oracles for any given real is a compact set. Um, so that's that's a little detail that I'm not going to come back to. So this is just so we know what it means for an oracle to represent a real number. It's um, just some nice enough representation as an infinite stream of digits. Similarly, you can represent a sequence of real numbers just by doing the usual trick of pairing, and so then you can have a a, a sequence of oracles, more or less, one for each real number. So if you have a if you have a pairing function, you can say that R a map. So there can so if you define this map R, which takes a sequence in the counter space and rearranges it so that it's a sequence of sequences, and then the nth term of the sequence of sequences represents the nth term of the sequence. You get the thing you want. So what more or less what you think of is like this again. 
given a sequence of real numbers A, there are some oracles representing it. And the way you think of the oracle is that this oracle is just a sequence of oracles that represent the corresponding terms of A. And again, this compactness property works, goes through. Okay, now, how are we going to beat the sequences that diagonalize? Now, here, as I said a couple of times, diagonalization works against any Turing machine with a single oracle. If you have a single oracle, so this is now that we're coming to the crux of the matter. Okay, so this is the this is this is where the idea is. You can't diagonalize against a single oracle because you just the usual construction of diagonalization is going to beat it. But what if we require it that diagonalization, the diagonalization procedure, should work against all oracles representing a sequence? What happens then? So now uh, let me define more carefully what I mean by that. Let phi be the usual um, enumeration of 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 uh, partial maps which are computable with respect to an oracle alpha. So phi n alpha is the nth partial computable map uh, with respect to an oracle alpha. Now, given a set of oracles S, say that an S, what does it mean to compute a real number with respect to all these oracles? So S is a set of oracles. So what I will require is that uh, the number n encodes a Turing machine such that if we give this Turing machine any oracle from S, it will always compute a representation of the real number. So it always has to compute n, phi n, has to compute always the same real number x, but it can use the or the one, it can use the oracle. However, every oracle that we give it should be good enough. And then you can do the same thing for sequences. Say that n computes a sequence, is an S index for a sequence, if it computes representations of that sequence with the help of the oracle, but it, every oracle in the set has to be good enough to do it. Now, what happened here? When you do this, this phi of n is forced to use the oracles in a more uniform way because it doesn't know which oracle it's going to get. Any one should be good enough. So it can't rely too much on any particularities of the oracles that it's getting. It has to work parametric, parametrically in the set of oracles S. Now with this definition, we, can, uh, we will be able to define what we want, but we need one more ingredient. And it's a generalization of Brouwer's fixed point theorem this is completely classical, by the way. And it says the following. Suppose you have a multi-valued map from the sequences to non-empty non convex sets of sequences such that the graph is closed. Then it has a fixed point. So at some point, I'm going to say, I'm going to construct a fixed point. And then I will say, by the way, we used some classical uh, fixed point theorem um, that is known to hold in classical mathematics. And it's about multi-valued maps whose images are non-empty convex sets. So now we're going to look at <laughs> Miller's construction of the magical sequence that we're after. This is going to be a sequence that um, beats diagonalization. So it will be a sequence that Turing machines, even when you give them the sequence, they can't diagonalize against it because we will require the machines to diagonalize parametrically in all oracles that compute mu. So that will be the change. We will say, OK, we can't diagonalize, at least not in a way that works for all oracles that represent mu. So let's read the theorem. It says there is a sequence such that if n computes, if n computes x, then mu of n equals x. So the way you think of it is like this. 
you take a Turing machine. So we take the nth function phi of n. And then if you give it any oracle for mu, it has to always compute the same x. If that happens, then mu already enumerated that particular x. That's what we want. So let's see, how am I doing on time? I am not going to go through the, all the details of this. This is a bit technical, but I'm going to run out of time if I spend too much time on this. So let's see, but let's nonetheless, let's go through the proof. So what you do is you first define a function which takes a sequence and produces, it's one of these multivalued functions. It takes a sequence and maps it a sequence of intervals. So I, let I be the set of all subintervals of the unit interval. So these are all the intervals zero, 0 to V, which are contained in the unit interval. So phi maps each sequence to an interval. And what it does, it has this property that if N computes a real number X, then the nth term will be that x. But there will be lots of numbers which don't compute real, which don't have the property that they are that they compute x with respect to the in, uh, with respect to uh, the oracles for a. A is the input to psi, and for those, it will return some interval because it you know imagine you have a machine that is, it looks like it's calculating a real, but it's not really, it stops converging. Maybe it's doing weird things. In such a case, you can't zero down onto a real that it's computing. Nevertheless, you can still come up with an interval. You say, okay, it looks like it's computing something in this interval. That's the sort of thing you can do. And that's what Psi does. In the next step, we very- Andre, can I interrupt to ask you a question from the chat here? Sure. So someone asks, in what way is a set an oracle? Is it an oracle for element hood of the set? How can a sequence be specified on a tape if that is the case? Okay, so let's be careful here. Okay, uh, where can I do this? I'll do it here. So an oracle is one single oracle is always an infinite sequence of bits. So obviously it can be specified on a tape. So one oracle is always a sequence like that. But what I'm doing is I am giving myself a set of oracles. And then I don't compute with respect to one oracle. What I require is that when I compute, I compute results with respect that when I want to compute something, I say you can compute it but your computation can use an oracle, but it has to work for all elements of, from my given set of oracles. So S itself is not an oracle. S is a set of oracles. Every single oracle is a sequence. And we're, when we're computing things, when we're computing things, we're requiring parametricity in the oracle. That is to say, for every oracle I give you from the set, you need to, you need to compute whatever it is that you're supposed to compute. Does that answer the question? I, I think it does. Um, yeah. yeah, thank, thank you. Okay, it's a bit, it's a bit, there are levels to this, so it's maybe a bit uh, uh, crazy. So whenever you see this written, this, okay? This means phi of n, phi of n needs to compute something and it will be given some Oracle alpha from this set of oracles, and it has to do its job, whichever oracle it gets. Okay? That's the bit that is changing. It's not just computing with respect to a fixed oracle, it's computing with respect to a set of oracles, and you have to succeed for any element of, from that set of oracles. Now, this uh, construction of psi, uh, the way that it works is that it takes a sequence A and then it calculates a new sequence that is able to beat any machine that will, it, it will enumerate at least all the things, all the, all, all the uh, reals that can be computed from the sequence A. Then you use the fixed point theorem to find a sequence mu, which I'm going to use to call Miller's sequence, 
such that it is the fixed point of this element of this uh, of this psi. And then after that, it's easy to show that mu has the desired property because if x is computed by the nth machine, that means that then it will be immediate that because mu of n is an element of psi of mu of n because mu of n, mu is a fixed point because x actually because the real number x is computed by index n then psi will say that index n computes this real number and then we will see that mu of n equals x this is all explained in in, in miller's paper okay how do we put these things together what is the plan the plan is that did I write down the plan? Plan. Here's the plan. It's now just a matter of technique. So if you if you, if 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 you have done realizability for a long time, then when you see this, you say, "Oh, I bet there is a way to do this." But I need to fiddle with realizability. So the plan is this: We'll take Miller's sequence. Miller's sequence has a magical property that you the Turing machines cannot diagonalize against it modulo this requirement that they work for any oracle that presents me. So we need a, new, a notion of realizability, which isn't a new notion of realizability. And we will do that using a tripos construction. A tripos is a very general construction, but what we will do is we'll have a specific tripos, which catches this idea of computing with respect to set of oracles. And then we turn the wheels of the tripos to topos construction, and we'll get a topos, which we I call the uh, um, parameterized realizability topos. And obviously, I have a problem with my LaTeX here. Yeah, so you don't see this, it's not around. And then we will show that this mu, the Miller sequence, is a morphism in the topos and it's an epic. Okay, so how do we do this? Now, we so this is now for people who are a bit familiar with realizability in realizability you define a notion of um, entailment between predicates where which uh, forms a height in pre-algebra and though you do it like this you take a set x and you say that the predicates on x are maps from x to the power set of n so if I have a phi, which is a map from x to the power set of n, then I think of phi of little x as this is so this is going to be some subset of the natural numbers. And you think of the set, this you think of this phi of x is the set of realizers, the set of machines, or the set of indices of machines that witness the fact that phi of x holds. So you don't say the things are just true or false, but you ask for programs that witness the fact. And what is crucial here is how you witness the, 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 the pre-order in the hiding pre-algebra. So we are going to turn this such predicates called these realizability predicates into hiding pre-algebra with the following entailment. To witness that phi entails psi, the idea is, the usual idea is that you take, that you can computably you can map with some algorithm, with some machine, realizers of phi to realizers of psi. So we're going to do that, but we will throw in this realizability, this oracle business. So we say, okay, there has to be a machine such that if I take any x in x and then I take any n in phi of x, the machine will take n and map it to a realizer for psi of x. But it needs to be, it has to do so parametrically in all the oracles from this given set O. So O could be any, any set. And then phi has to work, has to do this job given any oracle. So now translating to the tripos, this idea that we want computability parametric in a set of oracles. Okay, again, the set itself is not an oracle. What we're saying is for every oracle in the set, you have to compute correctly. And then you have verified that this is a tripos. You know, you spend five days verifying this is a tripos. You find errors, you fix things. And then 
uh, you get a topos out of it. And then you explore the topos. So what is there to be said about the topos? I don't have a lot of time to say about a lot about the topos. Uh, we certainly want to explore it in the future. Um, but let's just focus on the result. OK, so this requires verification. But we have an explicit construction. We can verify explicitly that in the topos, the following object is the object of the closed unit interval. So first of all, in the topos, there are very complicated objects. But there is a simple kind where you just take a set, some set x or some set, I don't know. Yeah, well, x. And then you explain what does it mean to realize an element of the set. And so let's be specific about this. I will give you a specific way of realizing the real numbers from zero in, in the closed interval zero one. Say that the natural number n realizes the real number x if the corresponding Turing machine, the corresponding partial function, the nth compute, the nth partial function, which computes with respect to oracles, calculates a representation of x, but it has to do so for every oracle in O. And then you take i to be the set of those axes which are realized by something. The object of such real numbers, which are realized in this way, turns out to be the Dedekind unit interval. This requires verification, but it's not, it's, there's nothing surprising here. It's technique. So once you know that, you can get through this theorem, namely that the that Miller sequence is an epimorphism inside the topos, and I really have a problem here. Okay, how does it work? So first of all, you have to uh, think to see that mu is realized by something, but um, that's not too hard. So I'll skip this part. This is the bit here. We want to show that mu is epi. What does it mean that mu is epi? For every x in zero one, there exists an n such that mu of n equals x. We need to realize this. How do you realize this? You need a realizer E, which is going to map realizers of X to realizers of this statement. And I claim the following works. This E has to be taken in such a way that when it gets a realizer K for X, it's just going to return K. So it claims if K is a machine, if K encodes a machine that calculates X in this Oracle way that I've been discussing, then in fact, you can take N to be simply K and this zero here is just witnessing this equality. Equality is uh, stable, so anything realizes it. It's not not stable. So uh, this is not, not uh, on, on real numbers. It's, all, it's, it's not not stable. So uh, you can put anything here. It doesn't matter what I put here. It could be something else. Now let's see why is this why is this e okay? So let's switch back to it. So suppose n realizes the real number x. Well, then according to what I just said on the previous slide, this means that given any oracle alpha, if I look at the nth function equipped with the oracle alpha, it will calculate a representation of x. Well, but that's exactly the condition that tells me that mu of n equals x. So therefore, that's it. N is the witness I'm looking for. So phi of E N says N is the witness. Yes, and zero. Why does zero realize this equality? Because the equality actually holds. And I'm done. OK, so let me have some concluding remarks here. Um, uh, James came up with an argument which I haven't actually digested yet, but so this is maybe a little more provisional, but the object, so James can confirm that whether he still believes this, um, that the object of sequences is also countable. But then something very nice happens. If this object is countable, then also very easily, this object is countable. But then this thing has the fixed point property. What does it mean to say that this is the closed n-dimensional ball? The closed n-dimensional ball has the fixed point property. 
So we get an example where the Beer's fixed point theorem implies Brouwer's fixed point theorem in the super strong form that says every function on the closed form on the closed ball has a fixed point. I suspect that this topos also validates all functions are continuous, but I, I, this is, let, let me say that I bet that this is the case. So this will then be slightly less surprising, but it's a nice, it's a nice, it's a nice, another nice fact. And of course we want to uh, explore the topos further, right? So, oh, by the way, here I was doing the, here I was doing general oracles. When we switch, when we switch to the main theorem, I was using oracles that compute mu, just the, okay? So it's a particular one. We, so we want to we want to think about this one further. And in fact, I represented just the tripos, just the notion of realizability needed to define the particular topos we're interested in. But we have defined a general notion of parameterized partial combinatory algebras, which are comb partial combinatory algebras that calculate with respect to any set of parameters. And then how things evaluate depends on the set of parameters. For the programmers in the audience, it looks a bit like some sort of a reader monad thing. And you can think of computing with respect to a reader of uh, oracles as the reader giving you the oracles, the reader monad which gives you the oracles. So that was for the Haskell programmers in the audience. Um, so there is a more general notion here of realizability that 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 i think will be uh, it will be interesting to explore whether it can give us some other weird stuff and that's it thank you i'm done thanks andre that was a really interesting talk um did anyone have any questions that they wanted to ask the speaker so jacques asked whether miller's theorem is classical yes it's very classical it uses classical fixed point theorems on the Hilbert cube. So very classical. Dana Scott here. What about yes. the, um, well, uh, uh, what about the Cauchy reels? What do you think about that? Okay, so we know that the Cauchy reels in this topos are different from the Dedekind reels because, uh, <coughs> well, we know that they are restricted um, one, they're, they're different, and we don't know what their status is in this topos. So, for uh, so two remarks, therefore, the question remains open for Cauchy reals, but we know that um, any topos that satisfies countable choice has uncounted. If you have countable choice, then Cauchy reals and Dedekind reals coincide, and they are uncountable. So what remains is the following question. You're in a setting where you don't have countable choice. You consider Cauchy reals. Are they countable? Well, Cauchy reals in a setting where you don't have countable choice are ugly. I mean, you have to, it's, it's even a question. I think it's not even obvious how you make them. I mean, you have to be, you, have, you probably, you should not just metrically, you just, you, you should metrically complete the rational numbers but that's a complicated construction because you don't have countable choice. You throw in all the Cauchy sequences and then you're not done because you don't have, you throw in Cauchy sequences of rationals, but you're not done because you don't have cash, uh, countable choice. You have to th throw in Cauchy sequences of Cauchy sequences of Cauchy sequences like in the hot book. So I don't know what to think about that, but it's hmm. open. And I thought I saw another question from Jan, did you want to ask a question? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the, the the set of oracles? Is it constructed to be countable itself, or? Um... Uh huh. Okay. Yes. No. In, so, in general, it'll contain a, a perfect set. Uh huh. So, right. So the, the 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 realizability setup when you when you when when you. Uh, um, construct the tripos and the general realizability constructions, they don't care at all what your set of oracles is, but it should be non-empty because if it's empty, you get some something trivial. For the particular construction where we take 
this set of oracles. So it's the oracles that compute mu. This one is a closed subset of counter space. And so it's a compact subset of counter space. Uh, and also uh, it's quite large, as in it contains a perfect set. Somebody said that. Thank David you. asks, how do we know that this topos is not trivial? Because if you have a non-trivial tripos, then you get a non-trivial topos. And this tripos, this notion, this heighting algebra. So it suffices to show that for one particular set X, this heighting algebra here is non-trivial. And that's easy. Dominic, did you want to ask a question? Yes, sure. Hi, Andre. Very interesting oh. talk. Um, in your very last second, I think you said that you suspect that all functions are continuous in this topos. Mm -hmm. You also think that they might all be computable? Well, they are all by design. They are all computable with respect to these oracles. Okay, but let me let me introduce a notion that is useful. We say when we say oracle computable, we say alpha computable for some oracle alpha, and then just it just means you have a Turing machine and it has access to alpha. So when you have a whole set of oracles, I want to call this parametric co parametrically computable in this set, which means whatever it is that you're supposed to realize. You have to realize it, realize it given any one of these parameters, any one of these uh, oracles. So they're not going to be computable. For instance, mu lives in the topos. Mu is very non-computable. Mm -hmm. And internally, this is the same. So internally, all functions are thought to be, or they, the topos ah. things that are, are uncomputable functions inside it. Okay, so now you're asking whether the internal Church's thesis holds in some shape or form. Exactly. Uh, uh, it will hold in a funny way. Uh, every function from n to n has an index n. You see, the usual Church's thesis says for every function n that exists an index n, and then you involve Clinis T and U predicates to explain what it means that the index n computes mm -hmm. f. Here, it's not going to be uh, cleanest T and U. It's going to be some adaptation of cleanest T and U that drags in these oracles. Okay. That's the best you will be able to do. OK, I see. Thanks. Valeria, did you have a question? Yeah. Hi, hi Andre. Thanks oh. very much. Very nice. I, I wanted you to go to back to 20, slide 24, please. Because one of the things that's bothering me quite a bit is the fact that, you know, when you write there for all alpha in O, you know, you keep, kept saying that this has to be parametric. But ah. there's no description of parametricity in the ah. formula that we are looking at, right? So the parametric is in your discourse <laughs> and in the way I should be thinking about it. Okay. I think I know what bothers you. Uh, I, for, okay, so if you and I were at a computer science conference and I said parametric, right, then we would have a certain thing in mind, yes. which is arising from things like programming language theory. Yes? No, yeah. I meant something completely naive. I just meant think of these as parameters to your computation. It has to work for every parameter. There is no, just that, okay? So I apologize for maybe using the wrong word. And if you know a better word, I would like to know it. How right. do you say- I mean, I mean the, the, you're right. That's exactly yeah. my point, is that I thought there was some sort of naturality that should come no. associated to this notion of, of a set of oracles ah. uh, all, right? That they, you know, more than simply saying that they, they, they calculate uh, yeah. numbers by by the same uh, i mean that th there's a collection that th this collection is calculating x's little x's uh, giving the same little x i thought there was some, some sort of other structure you know 
category theory is always trying to find the, the, the structure behind it. And, and, and yes. in this case, I'm not seeing any. So I kind of, but, but, but you know, your answer is, is good. It means, yes, I was making this mistake of reading it in the way that computer scientists would. But I wonder if there isn't really something well, still. What we would need to do, okay, so first of all, observe that there is, so uh, uh, warning, I'm switching to computer science talks, talk here with Valeria. So first of all, notice that there is a bit of naturality slash parametricity because it has to be the same index and then it's getting in these oracles and the way that a machine accesses the oracle is fairly uniform. It's just accessing the bits. So you could argue that there, is, that there is a little bit of parametricity or naturality there. It can't just, you know, it's, 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 it's the way that a machine uses the Oracle by itself is a little bit parametric. You know? And the other thing is that uh, if you look at how we defined uh, partial combinatorial algebras in general, there also you get this business that you have to have a single realizer that's then working for every possible state in the reader monad. So I don't know if you would say that that's um, parametric, but it's definitely perhaps, one. perhaps a better way would be to call it. Yes. Are you hearing me? Perhaps yes. a better way would, uh, would be to call it uniform. I don't know. Yeah, uniform. Uniform, yes. So uniform yes. is also a good word. So if I said that it has to be computable uniformly in the set of oracles, would that be better? I think so, but maybe right. Valeria, this is yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll we'll stop the live stream here. Um, so thanks again for the for the talk. Um, and um, I don't know, Andre, if you want to stay around and continue to answer yeah. questions, um, you're, you're you're welcome to. But I don't know what your your obligations are. So officially, we're we're done. So. Okay, thank you. It's still the it's sunset.